<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That beautiful playing. Thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival and also to their partner, the Hyde Park Jazz Festival, for having me here to get to talk to this now bona fide genius. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Vijay and I are about the same age. They're actually one year younger than me. And I got my, my PhD at NYU. And I think my second year at NYU, um, maybe 2001, we were both, I was 18 and you were 17, I think. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wait, I wasn't, wait, 2001? Okay, yes. Um, Let's go with it. Let's go with it. 17, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I signed up to take this really intriguing sounding class. I, had to, I don't remember the exact title, but it had to do with embodiment and gender and race and jazz. The first day, in walks Vijay, and I'm like, who is this kid? He had just like <laughs> this baby face, and I was just like, Wow, okay. But, you know, I think as soon as you opened your mouth, I realized, all right, we're, we're dealing with an uh, incredibly um, thoughtful and, and sort of boundary pushing uh, just thinker and musician. And um, ever since then, I've been a big fan. So oh. thank you for that, well, <laughs> that early experience. I'm trying to remember the name of that course. Yeah. I think it was 21st Century Perspectives on improv improvisation, something like that. And then the, the trick was that once everyone walked in the door, they realized that they, their perspective, your perspective, was a 21st century perspective. It wasn't that I was going to teach you anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Conference of the Birds, you know? Everyone gets to their destination and they realize, oh, it's us. That was the idea. I don't think I realized that until quite a bit afterwards, but that's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so I imagine that you all have some sense of this, this man's extraordinary biography. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the accolades, but you should know, Grammy-nominated composer, pianist, um, with way, way too many honors to mention. Um, but these do include a 2013 MacArthur Fellowship, 2012 Doris Duke Performing Artist Award, um, and all kinds of triple and quadruple and quintuplet crowns from Downbeat um, for winning multiple uh, titles, you know, Jazz Artist of the Year, Pianist of, of the Year for um, two very influential albums, uh, Acce Accelerando and Historicity, uh, both of which feature the, your work with the trio. So hopefully we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> go, go check out the Wikipedia article. I'm going <laughs> to... I better go edit that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think what, what I would really like to do is maybe instead of using these extraordinary accomplishments, these sort of guideposts for a sort of formal conversation, is um, if, if you all will allow us, maybe just open up this conversation to the idea that you've promoted that improvisation is really real life in real time. So we'll just see how it goes. All That's right? Good to me. Okay. I do have this if we, if we end up needing it. Hmm. Um, so I, I guess I do want to maybe start with just this idea of improvisation. Um, I'm interested in a quote of Muhal Richard Abrams that, that you have promoted, where he describes it as a human response to necessity. So can you just, what does that mean? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that was my question when he said it. Uh, this was, um, right. Muhal Richard Abrams, as you may know, is a pioneering musician from here. He was one of the founders of the AACM, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Basically in this neighborhood, right, on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and he was on a panel discussion, kind of about theorizing improvisation that was convened by George Lewis, also from here, and one of his sort of pupils and uh, collaborators, and also an AACM 
artist and chronicler. Uh, this was at Columbia University, I would think about seven or eight years ago. Um, and it was, people were speaking about improvisation from various perspectives and disciplines. Patricia Williams, the law professor, was also on the panel. Yusuf Kumanyaka, poet. And um, Mr. Abrams was interestingly quite um, reticent <laughs> in that conversation in the sense that he didn't um, take the opportunity to hold forth or something like that. He just kept circling back to that sentence, improvisation as a human response to necessity. And I guess I just kept thinking about it because um, when we think about improvisation, we can think of it in very broad terms as the capacity that we all have to uh, perceive, think, and act in real time. That doesn't really narrow it down, actually. It's kind of, a, it basically encompasses almost everything that we do all day, every day, for our entire lives. Um, so that becomes this kind of crushing anxiety, like, well, how do we even talk about this thing? And so when I heard him use that definition, or use that sentence, um, kind of almost like an incantation, you know, he kept coming back to it in a way that, uh, first of all, grounded it in human experience, and also grounded it in kind of a, there's, there's, something, there's something political about that particular way to define it, because it, in other words, that I guess that it's never happening in a neutral space, that it, um, it's happening for, perhaps in response to conditions that might be imposed on you. So you could see that as sort of an interventionist definition that recovers it from the kind of um, perplexing totality of, you know, like, the fact that improvisation is kind of everything that we do, but rather to sort of uh, redefine it in an empowering sense as uh, something we must do uh, when called on to do it, when the call comes. So that's, uh, that kind of frames it, you could say, as activism or as uh, uh, gives it a sense of purpose, I guess. So I, I guess I'm intrigued by that, by that kind of, actually, I guess what we have then are sort of two understandings of it, at least. <laughs> One that's sort of so all-encompassing that we can't really pinpoint it. And another that's quite specific, actually. So that's why I keep finding myself returning to that sentence. This is kind of like, uh, it's grounding, in a way. It, it's, yeah. Even if I don't fully understand it yet. I find that the more I invoke it, the more pathways it opens for me in my thinking. Right, right. Well, I found that, you know, as a part of doing some of this preparation for our conversation, but it's gonna be, I think, a kind of touchstone for me going forward as well. I think it already has been in a certain way, but what I like about it is that, you know, on the, on the one hand, it does, shift the conversation about improvisation from, you know, from, from this idea of, I don't know, there are all these sort of like very neat sentence length answers about, you know, how jazz musician, like some things that put it in tension with composition. Hmm. Um, and things that do sort of definitions that, that take it out of the world maybe put it like it's some kind of abstract thing that some process is happening just in your brain and so I guess it's um, for me a way of you know not just saying that it, it is uh, can take many forms it happens in the brain it happens in in the body it happens between people um, but also it opens up this possibility that any of us can be improvisers and then by extension artists so I can think about even maybe my work as an administrator as um, you know as these sort of moments of you know responding to necessity um, and then therefore as activist work mm. so yeah I think it's I think it's a really powerful way to think about it uh, 
I'm glad. I mean, it's, you know, it's not... Um, I'm actually teaching a course this semester at Harvard. It's a graduate seminar called Theorizing Improvisation. Um, Causing all kind of trouble out there, yeah. So the syllabus heard around the world. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're looking at it, the idea from a lot of different perspectives. And it seems like... Um, why do we even need to use the word, first of all, in the, to begin with? It's used kind of in distinction to other things that you mentioned. Like, it's sort of used as sort of the opposite of composition or something like that. Right. Um, it's also used as a kind of um, trope or like a, a stand-in for the concept of freedom. Mm -hmm. Which then, you know, the reason that we even need to think about freedom is because we live in a world that's often marked by its absence or the revoking of it, uh, and particularly in in this particular history that we're embedded in, that that's a large part of it. You know, the revoking of personhood, the revoking of agency, the revoking of freedom. So then, improvisation becomes this way of navigating around the question of freedom, uh, which is kind of a it's a recent idea, if you think about in human history, that idea of freedom is something that we have. Uh, so I guess I think, I think of improvisation and freedom as this kind of entangled bundle of um, problems mm. <laughs> that we, <laughs> we have to kind of think through uh, from as many angles as we can. Um, and that's maybe why it's framed in, in Muhal Richard Abrams' sentence as necessity. Um, that kind of pulls it out of the idea of just sheer play in a neutral domain and more into a, uh, a question of what's po what is possible for you as a person this moment and can you expand that sense of possibility using whatever is at hand. Um, a sort of life hack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm interested especially in kind of teasing it away from that dichotomy of composition and improvisation because that is sort of a false dichotomy. Partly because as both Schoenberg and Wayne Shorter have famously quipped, uh, composition has just slowed down improvisation. All right. right. So that's a that kind of flips everything, right? Yeah. But the other thing yeah. is that why do we even care about the distinction? Part of the reason is because composition is something that has value in the West. Particularly, I mean, in the political economy of music, composition is what receives royalties, what is a legacy that, you know, that accrues value on that in a market. Mm -hmm. Improvisation has literally zero value in the political economy of music in the sense that the Charlie Parker estate is not receiving royalties off of people listening to his improvisations. They're, li they're receiving royalties off of what were deemed his compositions. Um, so there is a literal sense in which Improvisation has literally zero value. So that's part of the anxiety that we're kind of bound up in. It's like, well, is this, does this value? Does this have value in in our in our context? The other question, though, that is kind of, um, you know, if we sort of put that conversation aside, that dichotomy, because really, when we talk about composition, the real dichotomy is between composition and performance, because that's the sort of strange bifurcation that's happened in Western music where people who make music aren't the people who do music. So there's somehow this difference between people who make and people who whose bodies do the work, the mm -hmm. labor of mm -hmm. making sounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of, and in, improvisation is, a, is something that breaks up that All distinction. That. Right. You know? So, I, I, so I, it's not interesting to me to think much further about the difference between composition and improvisation. But what is interesting to me is, um, because people ask me all the time, 
It was just asked of me on Friday and this morning, in fact, what percentage of that, that I, whatever I just did was composed and what percentage was improvised. <laughs> uh, it's like baseball stats or something. Right. Um, <laughs> And I think it's because, why do we want to know? I mean, it's partly because of that value question. But it's also because we kind of want to know, uh, at what point were you here with me when you were doing that? That's sort of the question. Were you in the same moment that I was in when I was listening to you? Were you talking to me? That's kind of the question. You talking to me? Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's really, in other words, is this an intersubjective moment, or are you just showing off? <laughs> 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 so that's the question that, um, and the reason I think that that's a question is because of empathy, of the question of empathy, which we can talk about more in a little bit. So. Yeah, you bring so many points up. I do want to talk about empathy, um, but I... I also, you know, I also just want to respond to, um, to that whole, or just maybe bring in another perspective with regards to that dichotomy between improvisation or the supposed dichotomy and, and composition, you know, looking at it from, from sort of my worldview and where I stand, thinking about the, a place like the Center for Black Music Research, um, thinking about the role of these kinds of archival exercises, um, and thinking about the fact that when uh, Sam Floyd founded the CBMR 30 years ago, um, you know, the the main emphasis there was on concert music, was on you know, classical music by African American composers, mm -hmm. um, and it was very much in that response to you know it was in recognition of this sort of widespread belief that that has value, mm. right? And that that's those kinds of documents, um, those manuscripts um, are are the, the the currency, the historical currency. Um, you know, and that came out of such a such a sort of specific political and cultural moment for him, and now what, you know, in my work, trying to recognize um, that history, but then also, you know, recognizing what's exciting to me about doing the archival work, mm -hmm. is realizing that that in itself is this kind of composition or very slow improvisation. There's nothing that's really um, sort of set about the way that the archival enterprise has to grow and there are all these spaces for um, for improvisation there and for you know and for empathy and for the ephemeral mm -hmm. um, you know so that it's not all just sort of neutral and static but that it is evolving and um, and that's something that's you know that's exciting to me to be able to think about history as you know, all of these things together. So it's just another angle, like, coming at, I think, basically what what you're saying, but looking at it from this other mm -hmm. institution-building, you know, standpoint, seeing how those things kind of come in and out of tension with each other. Um, I think a lot about how um, communities, organizations, uh, aesthetics form very gradually over time in a way that no one's really um, forcing. Um, or how things sort of happen in the breaks of culture. And, uh, All the good stuff, yeah. anyway. Yeah. The stuff that's not official is actually the stuff that we want to pay attention to. Um, what people do when they're not doing anything. That's kind of, I guess that's where my ear is pointed most of the time. Um, and even in the way that I collaborate with people, a lot of it is just about being together for pretty long periods of time yeah. <laughs> until something emerges from that sense of being together and, you know, about what is it that we can do together? What can we build or make together? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, you know, in a way it takes it out of the realm of genre or style or even sometimes out of the realm of music uh, or you have to you find yourself kind of re 
thinking what music is or can be. And to me, it ends up being that music is whatever it is that we can do together. Yeah, it's a verb. Yes. <laughs> it's a verb. So it seems like this is maybe a good time to talk about um, maybe maybe empathy and collaboration. But you are, I mean, a big, I guess, pretty well-known aspect of your practice is are these kind of you know, long um, sustained collaborations with, with artists across different iterations or, or works. And, you know, one of those for sure is, is your work across, I don't even know how many years with, with Mike Ladd, with the poet Mike Ladd. Yes. And you have just, um, just completed uh, one of these iterations in collaboration with Mike Ladd called Holding It Down. Can you can you share a little bit yes. about that with us? Well, it was um, it was released as an album a year ago, uh, and that was after f a four-year long kind of sustained uh, immersion is maybe not the word because we kind of moved in and out of it, but uh, sustained interaction with uh, veterans of color from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan specifically. Um, we were just interested in listening to veterans. This is partly because the projects we had done prior to this work uh, were kind of about the wars without really being about the wars. I mean, right. there was, they were sort of dealing with the reality of living in the United States under perpetual war without really um, staring it in the face, you know? So it was about the atmosphere of surveillance and paranoia Particularly, you know, our early projects, our first project was about people of color in airports. Um, that was in 2003, so it was in that atmosphere. Uh, our second project was about 24-hour news, kind of satirical engagement with the 24-hour news culture in a time of war. So we realized that, okay, if we're going to do anything else, we have to really just... Um, talk about what we've been avoiding talking about. Mm. That tends to be, a, that's sort of the pattern that we've established. Is what, is, what's, what, is it, what is it that nobody wants to talk about? Let's make a project about it. <laughs> Our nickname for it is Irritainment. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is our third volume of Irritainment. Um, it's called Holding It Down, the Veterans Dreams Project. We interviewed veterans of color specifically about their dreams, um, and particularly, you know, dealing with the post-9-11 wars. Uh, we just wanted to see what would happen if we spent time with and among them building something with them. Mm -hmm. Not making something about them, but actually really making it theirs. Right. So maybe we could show this video. It's a, it's a kind of sales pitch, I'm sorry, but it's a... It's basically a promotional video for the, for the project. Muscled up the top of Ford, Taurus, SES, wife beater, wrench in hand, Nostrum and Madison next to I was like, I feel like Jay-Z, man. This is awesome. The entire album involved Mike interviewing a lot of veterans. And then working with that, those interviews and transforming them into poetry and lyric and song. Which focus on the dreams of veterans. Get down, Life, rain, all night. Holding It Down started as an idea that Mike Ladd and I had as a way to build outward from two projects we had done before, both of which had to do with American life during wartime since 9-11. We decided that if we were going to do anything else together of that nature, it would really need to deal with the lived experience of war. Crimson syrup drips from a rib. The reason the project focuses on dreams is that, one, it gives us a creative flexibility, but more importantly, it was looking for a common ground where veteran and non-veteran could meet. Millions of Americans are veterans, you know. Oh, oh, 
It's not about the three million, it's actually more about everyone. We all are um, a part of this. Today, he died for the last time. He is survived by memories of dreams. What we chose to do was um, collaborate with veterans specifically. Not just make the project about them, but really make it with them and for them and by them. We were lucky enough to find Maurice to call in the New York Times. I was in the Marine Corps from 1998 to 2002. Got out, joined the reserves, went to Iraq in 2003, and the last time in August of 2005. He ended up writing about 40% of the material. The process of writing these poems helped me to remember, deal with, and accept the experience, but also to understand that you know Iraq doesn't have to influence the rest of your life, it's just one very small part of it. It was very important for us to have a woman's voice in this project. I have a capacity for war. I have a capacity for hate. I have a capacity for... I've never talked about my military experience before that. We were very fortunate to meet Lynn Hill. Uh, my last assignment, I worked with Predator Drones. Your experiences, the pain or how you struggle with them, sometimes all you need is just a voice to just bring it out and give it wings and give it life. And this project really helped me do that. Pull the trigger. And they said, Lynn, hit that target. And they would say, Lynn. We did things at work. Hot? We saw things when we were at work. But then you at four o'clock, you go home. And you got to go home to Susie Homemaker or whatever normal kind of is so for a person. and act like what you saw that day wasn't war. What is impressive about dreams is that it does create an environment that we do all actually share. I'm worried that if we forget how difficult the war has been, not just for the people who fought it, but for the families and for the nation, and also for the people on the other side, it's very easy to find ourselves in another very similar situation. I know what this project has done for me. Like, I know that it helped me to deal with some issues that I've never dealt with, to talk about things that I've never talked about, to go into a place to address a problem that isn't being addressed. Gets us at least a step closer to understanding each other. It, yeah, yeah, it really is. And so I just think about, all right, poor people, homeless people, veterans, and these areas overlap so many times. And, you know, I think it's so easy for people to talk about how to solve certain problems, but this project suggests that the best way to start maybe is just by listening yeah. to them. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that was our intent, you know, um, was start from there. Mm. Particularly, you know, we've been approached by uh, some people who ask us, uh, what's your stance on the war? And of course, nobody is, nobody wants war. Nobody likes war. Nobody is pro-war. <laughs> or are they? I don't know. Are you? <laughs> uh, 
No, I mean, the f fact is it's easy to, to critique the policies, but that's not what these mm -hmm. folks are about. I mean, they, uh, you know, especially in the context of an all-volunteer army, you have to look at who's involved, who is, who's enlisting and why. And it's usually out of need or perceived need or the kind of, um, you know, I worked with a guy in Philadelphia who, um, he's, he, does, he does what's called counter-recruitment because basically the military goes into the disadvantaged neighborhoods, the, the inner city neighborhoods, the poor and majority minority neighborhoods, you know, 90, 90 something percent African American and Latino neighborhoods, uh, goes to their schools, goes to the high schools and says, well, here's a way out, you know, this is a way to get, lift yourself up and right. you'll learn some college? skills that you can, you know, but you won't learn any skills. Basically what you'll be doing is putting your body on the line for some questionable, extremely dubious purpose. You know? So that's kind of uh, the reality. You know? And so it, that's partly why we focused on veterans of color. That's not to say that, um, you know, people have different reasons for enlisting. I mean, Lynn comes from a military family. And, uh, Maurice had actually um, admired, he'd, he'd studied, you know, he'd kind of been a fan of war history and stuff, even as a teenager. So, you know, there was a certain drive to kind of get into that culture anyway. But you also have to see it in that context. Um, so that's kind of uh, why we chose specifically to listen to these corners of that community. Uh, and a lot of things came out that we didn't foresee. For example, there's that scene there, you, or that shot there you saw of um, at where Maurice talks about families on the other side. You know, how often do you hear about that? There's a poem that he did in the performance where he refers to the enemy as cousin, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a sort of, that's a kind of, especially in the context of what was a very racialized war, and is, um, when you have soldiers of color putting their bodies on the line, encountering the face of what someone who could, or feels like it could, you know, maybe even acts like their cousin, what do you do then? So that's kind of the, the reality we want to s really just, listen for. So it basically leads us to think a little differently about community. That's right. right. Um, so I feel like I want to make sure we have some time to show a little bit of your filmmaking uh, venture <laughs> uh, before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I do, I do want to do that, but um, just before, can we um, just talk a little bit more about this idea of, of empathy and listening and ways that those are um, shaping your practice? I mean, I think I have, have been doing some, some work on this idea, um, you know, again, from a slightly different angle, but thinking about listening to Melba Liston's oral histories. Mm. And... Um, <clears throat> there was something that was very helpful to me. Uh, Shefali Saljani, who's an oral historian, um, talks about, you know, first of all, makes very explicit that anytime we're talking about, you know, an, an interaction or a relationship that we're really essentially talking about power mm -hmm. and, and where that power is distributed and how. Um, also, she mentions that, that there is this sort of middle level that we could, uh, that we could call rapport, mm -hmm. where there's kind of, you know, a conscious or semi-conscious decision that, you know, you're going to find some, sort of actively, you know, find some, some uh, you know, mutual ground. But then there's, you know, there's empathy, and that that's really the goal of, of creating and understanding oral histories, is that to, you know, really get into this idea of, um, you know, recognizing where the power lies and then trying to sort of dissolve that or move around that. Mm. So are those, is that those sort of layers of, of understanding or of um, trying to massage the, you know, any of the ways that power relations can be structured, is that helpful to you or is that something that you think about when you are 
performing and trying to gain empathy with your fellow musicians, you know, members of the trio or members of the audience? I've thought about this word anyway, this topic yeah. a lot. I mean, the word is so fuzzy, empathy. Um, makes you think of Star Trek, uh, if, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it also just makes you, it, it has that sort of touchy-feely kind of aura around it. But you know, it turns out that that word is only 100 years old. It was introduced into the English language as a translation of a German coinage by an art historian in the late 1800s. So it's actually not an idea that really, um, even though it has Greek roots, you think it's maybe from antiquity, but it's actually just somebody made it up in the 1917 or something. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like, we don't really know what it is yet. We're getting used to the idea. We're still trying it out. It's like when a child learns a new word and just uses it in every, you know, to me, to, in every conversation. <laughs> uh, um, but what, it seems to, what seems to be the intent behind that, introducing that concept is, as opposed to sympathy, right? Because right. sympathy is like, that means same feeling, right? So, oh, I can, I can, I can relate, or I understand. Empathy. That's for poor. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Empathy comes from, I mean, the, it's coined as a in. In feeling means that actually, it's almost involuntary. Like, you feel this thing that somebody else is feeling. It's not, it's not cognitive, in other words. It's kind of, it catches you where you're not looking. You know, so that's kind of what I'm interested. In. I'm interested in what happens from the shoulders down. <laughs> uh, that is like the heart, the guts, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's very hard to talk about. But in my studies of music perception and cognition, which is what my so-called PhD was, in, <laughs> I think of it as a hustle. But um, you know, uh, it was, uh, I was trying to understand how music works from an embodied perspective. Right. Uh, which is to say, um, what, is music made, what is music made of? Of course it's made of us doing things. I mean, it's, that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from outer space or from, or maybe it does, I mean, we all do. At some level, because we're made of stardust. We're star stuff. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it comes from us. That's the point. It doesn't come from the record store or from iTunes. It comes through those places, but it comes from bodies doing things, which means that it, the contents of music is literally action. It's made of action. It's the sound of bodies in action, you know? And the reason that it works, I think music works. I mean, it seems to work because every culture on earth has it, has music and dance coexisting. Uh, is because it is the sound of ourselves. It's the sound of each other. It's made of us listening to each other and doing things with and for and among each other. And that's why it works. It literally just hits you in the body because you hear another body doing something and your body feels like moving in that way. That's literally what happens. I mean, when we perceive rhythm, what happens in the brain is that the motor planning areas of the brain, which are sort of in the base of the brain, uh, plan for your body to act. They're basically... Um, they say that rhythm perception is an imagined movement. Uh, there's kind of no difference, in other words, between perceiving music and moving. It's the same thing. Um, so that is to say that when we hear music, we hear another body doing something, and we have that sensation of, like, of our bodies doing something that is resonant with that, that is similar to that or that is, that it is that, you know. So there's some kind of literal identification, or not literal, substantive, like material 
identification between music and us, like our, our bodies. And that's kind of where I think this question of empathy or this idea of empathy happens. Mm -hmm. When we listen to each other, we hear each other as people. That's a person doing that. Mm -hmm. But then that becomes a political question too, as I said earlier, in a context, in a historical context of the revoking of personhood. Are you able to hear another person? Can you really reach across these fictions of difference to hear each other? It's a real question. Right, right. And I know that you've said elsewhere, basically that is you know, kind of the, the definition of structural racism, yeah. right? Is that, that ability to just sort of willfully turn off your empathy mm -hmm. uh, for someone. Um, so I certainly appreciate that you um, are always, you know, keeping that touchy-feely, very <laughs> <laughs> soft word in the front of your mind. It is, it is important, uh, and it is political. Um, when you're working with your trio and you've worked with them for so long and you kind of go and do other projects and you come back and you go away and do other projects and then come back, how, I mean, that must, that, that sense of empathy must grow, or does it, you know, with, with this sort of group of people and, and your sense of familiarity and how does, if it does grow, in fact, how does that affect your work with them? Well, the it's art that you can make together. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of um, life lived together. It's sort of like being with your family. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, in ter particularly with those guys, it's sort of like being among cousins or brothers or something. Like you just step back into a familiar, um, an accumulated, a very you know thick, thickly accumulated kind of relationship. Um, that is intricate and nuanced and also very spacious because there's no demand on it. You know, it's just there, it just exists. Um, so that means that we can kind of trust each other to just, uh, uh, we can trust that if things will be okay, or that we'll basically still be there at the end. You know? Right, right, <laughs> no matter what, yeah. yeah. Well, I got the stage cue that we might just have a few minutes left. Uh -huh. um, do you want to play another example, or maybe? You know what I thought would be nice is to show people a, a clip of our newest project, which um, uh, been work we worked on for quite a time, quite a while. It's with my colleague Prashant Bhargava, who's in the house. He's a filmmaker, brilliant artist, maker. Things <laughs> and uh, we were uh, invited to create something in, uh, to commemorate the hundredth anniversary of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, of all things. Um, why me, you might ask? And I asked myself that question. <laughs> but I said, let's take the money. Let's figure out something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, we, um, I thought Rite of Spring. You know, I actually don't care. About I care about Stravinsky, but I don't think I need to add to the pile of tributes to Stravinsky. You know, there's enough of that. What I was interested in is what's a rite of spring that's meaningful to us? And uh, we looked at um, a rite of spring in India, which many of you may know. It's called Holi. It's that day when everyone throws colored powder at each other and colored, colored liquids. And it's kind of total chaos, but it's also extremely beautiful and it's a devotional. Uh, holiday, uh, it's um, basically about Radha and Krishna. Krishna, the Lord, the, the Hindu god, and his earthly consort, Radha. So we made a project together that my, Prashant made a film, and I created a score that we performed live with the film. The piece is called Radha Radha, Rites of Holi. Prashant went to, the, to Uttar Pradesh, the, in northern India, the Braj region, it's called, uh, which is the mythic birthplace of Krishna and Radha. And in this area, Holi is celebrated for eight days and eight nights, not just one day. So it basically takes over this community for 
a while, and they really immerse themselves in it. So this is a, a sequence from that film that will be released on DVD in a few weeks, and we'll be performing it around the country a bit. Uh, could you... First of all, gorgeous, but I hate to tell you, I did hear a little yeah. shout out to Stravinsky. I sure there. did. Sorry. Basically, the, there's a bassoon in there at all. It's a clear kind of. But this is actually in the middle of the piece, um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess for those who know, then there is a little bit of code. <laughs> we were code switching. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to do some code switching at the piano? To Am I allowed to, or there, are we out of time? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. This piece is called Remember. Mm -hmm. 